You thought I was going to play the whole thing. So that was Princess Leia's mom at the beginning of that video. Did you know that? Arguably the most famous scene from any movie. When they used to have the ride at Disney World for the movies, that was one of the ones. They did a big thing. You remember? Brian remembers that. You probably had to work in that ride. Great movie, though. So, um, you know, the world wants to tell you that if you have just the right girl, that you can sing in the rain. And can I tell you, it's not true. I mean, maybe Kristen. She's going to watch this later. So, right? So better, better say that. But the truth is, whether you have joy or not has nothing to do with whether it's raining in your life. And what I mean by rain is, you know what I mean, don't you? The struggles we have, the difficulty we have, the trials that we have, the the things we're worried about, the people who we wish would change or fix themselves. Somebody asked me this morning about boundaries. Great book. Some of you need it. But the truth is that this whole idea of making boundaries and doing all these things is nothing if we don't find our joy in who God is and what he's done for us. When you really begin to find that, it changes you. You know, a lot of you grew up in homes maybe with a dad who was distant. Um, And a lot of times we think God's that way. You know, maybe you only heard from your dad when you did something wrong. And the truth is God's the opposite of that. Um, and, And some of us, if we, when Paul says, I want you to know the love of Christ, it's It's not this love that just overlooks everything we do and we can just live in sin and it doesn't matter. No, it's a love that when you recognize how much God loves you, it makes you want to obey him. It makes you want to do what God wants you to do. And in that, you find joy as you you walk in his light and walk in his love. All right, two quick announcements uh, before I get to the sermony. Uh, first one is 4.30 today, I'm taking, our small group is going in the big city of Titusville. By the way, I always say that as a joke, just so you know, I grew up in Miami, moved to Titusville, and I remember laughing when people said, let's go to the mall, and I went, mall? Anyway, <coughs> so 4.30 today, we're going to see Jesus Revolution, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, I experienced some of that, and I'll probably share that in the next few weeks as a kid. Um, we had uh, uh, groups who got saved and came to church, and um, Ernie was one of those. And so, um, right? Jesus, uh, Ernie was part of that. So when you watch that movie, you can just think of Ernie. He is going to be the lead character, and that old, right? But but long hair, right? The whole deal. You had the long hair and the whole deal. And um, anyway, so I'm looking forward to that today. And so 4:30, if you want to come up there and meet us. And then the second thing. You know, we've been talking about revival a lot um, online and uh, TV. They've talked about it. But let me tell you what real revival is to me. Real revival is when you have people stepping up to serve and other people inviting them in and people learning to use their gifts to bless other people. And last night we had three or four youth helping in our Saturday night service. We have two youth up here this morning helping and I would love to live forever, but 50 years from now, I will no longer probably be preaching unless there's some kind of marvelous invention. No, I don't want to be preaching that long, but anyway, but, but, 50, but they'll still be singing, and they'll still be serving, and we need to, as a congregation, look for these opportunities to not only bring, because that's why this movie is about the Jesus revolution, the people that age coming into the church and Churches that learn to accept change, accept what God was doing. Not change the scripture, but change how God uses it. So that means that you don't always get to sing your favorite song. Sorry, sorry. You you don't always, I mean, somebody had to quit singing Gregarian chants. You realize that, right? Like there was one day there was a priest somewhere going, in Monte Olivetti, and somebody came in singing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. And that priest went, oh, that's a terrible song. Who wants to sing those modern songs? There's no harmonies and melodies, and they're so repetitive. They just sing the same thing over. Does it sound familiar? 
So we have to learn revival is really about helping folks come to know him and then showing them the way. But we have to make room. We have to make room for people to do that and go out of our way to do that. Now, here's my question from being in the mountains 10,000 feet where only one day did it rise above freezing. It got to be, no, no, excuse me, not one day did it rise above freezing. The warmest day got up to the high of 31 degrees. And I became very quickly, recognized very quickly that I should never move to Colorado (laughs) and want nothing to do with it. Maybe I could move there from July to September Okay, August, maybe, maybe, maybe. But I got to drive on ice. Anybody in here ever driven on ice? Such a joy. Such a joy. So we pulled out of the airport. I had to pull into this uh, uh, gas station. And as I turned left, the first left turn, my front tire in a four-wheel drive caught ice. And I thought, well, it's four-wheel drive. No big deal as the car kept going straight as I was trying to turn. And I kept telling it, you're supposed to be turning And I did what all old people do. I turned down the radio, (laughs) told everybody to be quiet in the car. But they all heard that noise, and they all got quiet. I didn't even have to yell at them. They knew, Dad's going to kill us all. We better get quiet. (laughs) And there was no noise as I went around the corner. Can I tell you what happened from then on? I drove slowly. Kristen did not have to say, honey, slow down. Sometimes she said, it's going to take us forever to get there. (laughs) Hint, hint. I'm thinking about how the airbag is going to hit me, right? I mean, that's the kind of driving I'm doing, right? And I felt so out of control especially when you could see that there was ice on the roads and people passed me and I thought, God bless you and keep you on your journey. (laughs) Somebody tailgated me and I thought, God bless you and keep you because I'm not stopping. I can't even hit my brakes to mess with you because we would all die right here. So we're just going to be nice to everybody. It's a joy. But both hands on the wheel, radio turned down for hours, driving to the mountains. Who lives here? Why do they live here? So we get to the mountains, 10,000 feet. There's ice and snow everywhere. And and I had to park. I had to pull the mirrors on this car in and had to get everybody out of the car to park. I was surprised I didn't climb out the window, but I was able to open my door enough to get out and slam the car. I mean, carefully not hit the car next to me and climb out of the car. And I mean, just crazy. I said, who would live here? One of my friends from high school messaged me. Hey, my son runs a restaurant right around the corner from where you're at. And I said, who would want to live here? You have to dress for battle every day when you get up. You're putting on 12 things. I couldn't wear, I was going to wear shorts all week to everything. I just, I started to wear shorts to church today because I'm like so tired of too much clothing, right? But let me tell you the worst part. The worst part was feeling totally out of control driving. You ever feel that way in life? You feel like you're just starting to get things together and then something changes? Maybe it's a relative that you're praying for or worried about. Maybe it's a situation. Maybe the doctor says, come see me tomorrow. Tomorrow? It usually takes me a month to get in with you, right? By the way, you know bad news from doctors is when they're in a hurry. When they're like, come right in, you should go, oh, no. When they say, see in three months, you should be like, yes! You shouldn't be like, I can't believe the doctor can't get me in for three months. You should be like, woohoo! I'm going to live for three more months because he's not getting paid till then. That's what you should be excited about. So when you look at Psalms 103, and we're going to look at Psalms 103, and I'm going to throw in Philippians 4, because I always like to, when I'm looking at Old Testament uh, uh, scripture, I love to, to compare it to what's going on in the New Testament because we look at the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. I am so thankful that I don't have to obey Levitical laws. You know, I can eat bacon and shrimp and cheeseburgers. Do you know they can't eat cheeseburgers? Did it make you cry, Marcus, a little bit? You shed a tear for those poor people. 
And God's freed us from all that, and yet there's principles in the Old Testament, and Psalms 103 is one of those principles where we see David who, who with a slingshot, killed Goliath. And this morning, this is the kind of stuff I think of on the way to church. Did David carry that around once in a while? Do you think David every once in a while had that slingshot, like he's king, and he's just like, what now? <laughs> what, what were you saying? What? You, you don't agree with what I said last? Really? All in favor, right? Right? So, so, you know, you just wonder stuff. And I figure he probably had it somewhere. Don't you think he had David? And, and he saw death, and he saw battle, and he saw God come through, and he blew it really badly. I mean, total tragedy. And yet God redeemed all that. And David, way back in the un- Old Testament understood so much more than even the Pharisees and Sadducees about God's love and how much God loved and redeemed him. Although, and you look in in Psalms, you can see where he repents of, of his brokenness and how much he messed up. And then you get to Psalms 103 and you remember that he is remembering God's benefits. And if you want to live a life of joy, where you're singing in the rain, Just singing in the rain. If you begin to understand and count the benefits of knowing God, of how much He loves and cares about you, how much you matter to Him, that when you feel out of control, guess who's in control? God's in control. Our life feels like driving on ice sometimes. Sometimes we just don't notice it. By the way, you ready for this? You're always driving on ice. Always. You think you have control. Everything changes. Everything changes much better. Right? In a second, everything changes. We're always driving on ice, and yet we have God who says, I'm going to take care of you. And David knew this. So let's pick up with me. We're going to look at three things that can help you walk in joy every day. Number one, Praise God for renewing you. And this first word, praise, uh, uh, in the verse here, it says, praise the Lord, my soul. This word for praise is a word I'm sure you've never heard. Well, maybe when you're watching the news sometime, you heard this word. And and it might sound familiar to you, and you can let me know if you've ever heard it. But you're going to learn some some Hebrew today. And here it is, uh, Barak. You ever heard that word? That's like a new word for all of you. You've never heard that before. That word in Hebrew means to worship or bend the knee. And so when he says, praise the Lord, O my soul, the description over and over in this passage is, praise the Lord. When's the last time you got on your knees to pray? As you get older, it gets harder, right? You go to a church that has that kneeling thing and you're like, we got to go somewhere else, right? (laughs) Right? But the truth is, whether you do it physically or in your heart, really every time you praise the Lord, you should bend the knee. You should say, God, I'm nothing. You are everything. I think I know how to drive, but it's icy. And God, I trust you. So praise the Lord. All my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. That word holy means set apart. It means set apart for something different, different than you are. Aren't you glad God's different than you? I mean, you're happy, you're doing good, you're on the way to church, you got the praise music going, hallelujah, and somebody tailgates you. You change that quick, God's not like that. God's not like that. And then it continues, holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Now, I love this word in Hebrew for forget. Because I do this all the time. Actually, a few weeks ago, I talked about how I have a cube on my keys that lets me find my keys. When I lose my keys, I can push it on my phone. And when I lose my phone, I can push it on my keys. And people called me and texted me and messaged me and said, my husband needs that. Where did you get that? I want that. Where is it? I need that. And most of you know that a few weeks ago, I lost my keys, but I had forgotten to put a new battery in my cube, so I actually had to look for them everywhere. And guess where they were? Right where I left them. (laughs) Right? And so, 
This forgetting on all of its benefits is this idea of laying something aside. You knew at one time it was important, but now you've forgotten. And so David says, hey, don't forget what God's done for you. I know it's easy to get busy. It's easy to lay it aside. It's easy to get busy doing something else. But guess what? It's really important. So forget none of his benefits who forgives your sins. By the way, you notice where David starts. He says, don't forget his benefits. You know, the sin. By the way, over the years, I mean, 20-something years of being a pastor, I've talked to thousands of people, I'm sure. And in all those years, I've only had one person, when I said, are you a sinner? Only one person told me no. And I think they were arrogant, but that's another story, right? Only one person. I had people tell me, I'm good at it. I'm a professional sinner. I mean, I've had all kinds of answers over the years, but only one person who said, no, I'm not. Most of us know, I'm a sinner. I mess up. I blow it. All you got to do is drive to see waffles and back to see your sin. Because somebody's going to cut you off between here and there. It might be the pastor. <laughs> right? And so you're going to drive there, you're going to drive back, and you're going to, before you get there, and you're going to be like, oh, God, you know my sin. Here's the thing. You ready for this? God knows every thought you had. You ready for this? He knows if you're even paying attention to the sermon today. You, you might be, you're looking right at me, you're nodding, and you're thinking, Bacon. Or you're thinking about somebody who didn't say hi to you on the way in. Or you're thinking about somebody who didn't do something right. You're thinking about a problem that you had and you're not focused. And we sin. We get off track. We forget. And he says, God, the first thing I notice is you forgive all of my sin. David was a professional sinner. But he was also a professional confessor. And he was able to say, God, purify my heart. What I've done is in your eyes is wrong. And then it continues. He Heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. And that reminds us of Isaiah who says, you know, he, he gives you new strength. You ever been exhausted? You ever been worn out? You ever just discouraged? You ever just feel like I don't, I can't, I can't. You fill in the blank for what you can't, right? Honey, we're meeting with so-and-so. Oh, I can't. Honey, the family's coming over. Oh, I can't. The boss calls. We got to have a meeting. I can't. God, would you renew me like you renew an eagle? God, would you renew my heart, renew my strength? Some of you today, that's the only prayer you need from this sermon is, God, would you renew me today? One of the benefits that God does is he renews you. So if you're feeling tired out, worn out, struggling, dealing with something, maybe you've been worried about something, you lay it at his feet. Listen to what it says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about most things. No, anxious about anything. And here's what's funny about this. I told Kristen this morning, I said, Kristen, I woke up in the middle of the night because last night we had a visitor come to church and they asked me a question and I couldn't really answer their question the right way. So I just answered quickly and walked off. And at two o'clock in the morning, I woke up thinking about how I could have answered that question better. That was, and Kristen said, that was so helpful. I said, I know, so helpful to be up at two o'clock in the morning going, I should have answered better. Why is that light coming on in the yard? Maybe I could watch a movie. What should I do? Right? Right? Wake in the middle of the night. That's what this means. Do not be anxious. This is the idea of anxiety that wakes you up. How many of you have ever been woken up by anxiety? Right? Right? I asked somebody, did you wake up grumpy? They said, no, I let him sleep. So, <laughs> Bill, that was your wife. All right, so... Uh, <laughs> do not be anxious about anything, but what do you do instead? But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, God, thank you for all you've done. You're not laying it aside. You're bringing it out. Thanksgiving, what do you do? You present your request to God. Now, I'm going to come to that word present. We're going to use it in the word present. Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to tell you what to do with present your request. 
I want you to think of it as a Christmas present. So you can imagine if I bought a Christmas present for Bill, who I just made fun of, that if I came to Bill and I gave him the Christmas present and I walked off and I watched him open it and he got all excited because I got him tickets to the Daytona 500 and he got all excited and he started freaking out and then I went back and said, oh, Bill, that wasn't really for you. Give that back, right? (laughs) I'd be dead because Bill's much bigger than me. All right, So, so, but here's the truth about our prayer life. We present our request to God. And then a few minutes later, we go, I'm going to worry about that just a little more. Here, just give me that back. Can I tell you what to do when you do that? And you'll do it. You'll do it. You're just going to do it. So just know you're going to do it. Okay? So just give up and say, I'm broken. I don't know why I do it. I said I wasn't going to, and I did it. Okay, don't freak out about that. Here's what I've learned. When you take the present back, you ready? This is really complicated. Give it back. Oh, shocker. Lord, I give this situation to you with my family. I present it to you. What am I going to do about my family? What am I going to do? God, I give this present. Just just give it back. It's okay. It's okay to have to pray that 42 times. To break the cycle of you worrying and being anxious about something. Listen to what C.S. Lewis said. Though our feelings come and go, what happens? God's love for us does not. God, thank you that you're renewing me. Thank you for your love for me. Thank you that I don't have to worry because you're the one. Lord, you're the one who can renew me. I'm exhausted. But you can renew me. Number two, praise God for loving you. How much he loves you. If we could just grasp that, I think it would change our lives so much. Ricky bought this out in Zion National Park. We didn't need it. I remember when he bought it, I said, that's a closet rod they cut the end off of and put their name on it and sold it to you for money and put a sticker on it. And he said, that's what I want. I said, okay. I don't know where we're going to put that on the plane. Right? But let me tell you something about a stick that I've noticed when you go hiking. There's times where just having a little something helps to keep you from falling. It also gives you something to poke at snakes and stuff. My dog went out of the house this week in the front yard and found a turtle. My dog instantly found out it does not like turtles because that turtle did not leave my dog alone. It said, hum, and my dog went, I don't think my dog will ever mess with a turtle again. has nothing to do with the sermon. I just thought of that. So if you have a stick and you're going for a walk, And you see something you need out of the way, you push it out of the way. Or it helps you to stay steady. Listen, when you really begin, I'm not talking about a little bit, but when you really begin to understand how much God loves you, the most love you've ever felt for a person, the most butterflies you've ever gotten in a relationship, the most infatuated is nothing compared to how much God loves you. When you wake up in the morning, God sees you and goes, wow. You realize when God made man, he said it was good. He said it was very good. I mean, it's amazing to me to think, why in the world? Because I don't feel very good sometimes. Yet that's how God feels about you. Listen to what David says as he continues. He says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. This word for fear here means reverence. For those who recognize how powerful God is, how mighty he is, and revere him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Aren't you glad that doesn't say north and south? Because you go north, 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 and eventually you're going south. Oops, we're back. But if you go east, 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 you'll go east. And he says he has... Put our sins away. As much as he knows we're fragile and broken and forgives us our sins, his love is greater than that, and he pushes it aside. And then it continues, as a father has compassion on his children. Now, not all of your fathers did, but you know somebody who did. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Once again, that same fear. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And wouldn't David know this from fighting battle after battle? 
Do you realize how many people David saw killed? David saw mighty Goliath coming across the thing, and all the people, all the Philistines were like, he's going to take you out, dude. And the next thing you know, oh no. David saw that. Life one minute, we've all had that experience. We're just dust. We don't always recognize it. We don't always realize it. We think we're in a lot of control, but there's days where suddenly we realize, I'm driving on ice. But it doesn't matter. Listen to what he says next. He remembers that we're dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over and it's gone and its place remembers it no more. All we are is dust in the wind, dude. If you know that reference, you're old. Sorry, sorry. I refer to myself. But listen, he doesn't stop there because if he stops there, you're discouraged. All of a sudden, you're like, this is it? But then he continues, listen. But from everlasting to everlasting, what survives? The Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. You ever pray for your kids? You ever pray for your grandkids? You ever pray for those neighbor kids that you yelled at last week? God's love can be with them. God, I want your love to be with them. From everlasting to everlasting. So we're temporary, but God's love is not. And so the one thing that's going to last forever is God's love. And when you pay attention, you begin to count God's blessings and count what he does. You begin to recognize how great God's love is. And guess what? It's hard to have a bad day when you really are abiding in his love, when you're really living in his love. And by the way, it helps you to treat other people better when you realize, even though you're temporary, that God's love is permanent. And it's the one thing that will way outlast us. Aren't you glad that sore knee won't outlast you? Aren't you glad that sore back that you felt when you got out of bed this morning won't outlast you? In heaven, there's no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more baggage. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but I get it. With those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. That's why it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then it says, love your neighbor as yourself. This is a, Jesus summing up all the commands. By saying, as you do that, guess what? You're going to recognize my love. And by the way, when you begin violating God's commands and doing whatever you want, one of the first things that goes away is you sensing God's love. Because you're running from fellowship with him. One of the reasons people say all the time, well, I don't, I don't feel like God is present. Well, sometimes we don't feel like God is present because we put our hands over our ears. We didn't want to hear what he said last time, so we can't hear him now. We don't know his love. Why? Because we've been running from him for so long. We, like the prodigal children, we need to come home. In Philippians 4, 8, 9, it continues, Finally, brothers and sisters, and I said this to the kids this morning, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. And I love this. This is the word, think about such things, for count. It's where we get the word for logistics. And I love logistics. I love making things work. I love getting from one place to another and knowing how it's going to work, making sure things go well. So when we go to the airport with my family, I say, you go get the bags. I'm going to go get the rental car or our car, and I'll be back, and I'll pick you up. We'll save a half hour. Ooh. And when something doesn't go well, a flight's delayed, a, a moment's delayed, I get a flat tire, somebody stops at a green light. They're messing with my logistics. And my world falls apart. I want to push them through the intersection, right? So he says here, what are you supposed to count? You're supposed to count your life? No, no, no. All, everything that's pure and lovely and admirable and excellent, praiseworthy, count those things. You're so worried about all this little stuff, Eric. Count the big things. And then it continues. Whatever have you learned or received from me or seen me put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. You want to have peace? Quit thinking about whether you made that red light or not. Quit trying to cut seconds off your time. Hey, hey, you ready for this? If you were late somewhere, can I give you just an assurance? You left too late. Shocker, huh? but I tend to think it's that person in front of me that's making me late. No, I did that before I left the house. 
And yet, logistically, I worry about what everybody else is doing. And what does he say? Hey, whatever is worthy, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is excellent, think about those things. What are you focused on? You will not have a joyful day, no matter how great your day is going, if you're logistically trying to figure out every little thing. But when you let that go and you think about how good God is to you. Number three, praise God for ruling and providing. I love snowmobiling. I did it for the first time. It's hiking without work. Ooh, my thumb's tired. We went to the top of a mountain. There were no trees up there. The trees were gone. They don't, not enough oxygen for trees. I'm not sure we should have been there. <laughs> you mean there's not enough oxygen for the tree? All the way there, I kept going, wow. Wow, I'm sure the guy leading it, he probably couldn't hear me over his motorcycle thingy, but I, I said, wow, a hundred times. Wow, look how awesome that is. When's the last time that you just said, God, you are so powerful? When's the last time you went to the beach and said, look how awesome this world is? When's the last time you looked up at the stars and said, look how awesome what God created is? The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, and you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. When you're having a bad day, sometimes the best thing you can do is back up and look around. Back away from your problem, back away from what that thing is happening, from that situation that's going on, and just go outside. Recognize the power of God that created everything around you. And he's in charge. It may feel like slippery ice right now in your life. But when you recognize, you know what? I'm not even really doing that great at driving. I'm just holding on to the wheel. And if you'll let God direct your steps... We praise the Lord, all my soul. When's the last time you just took time to praise the Lord? Lord, I praise you for how awesome you are. Lord, thanks for those stars. We launch people tomorrow into space again. I mean, it's just amazing to me that we can even do that. By the way, I know several people who don't believe we've done that. I know a guy who works at the space center who doesn't think we've done that. I want to put him on a rocket. (laughs) Just saying. The Lord has established. Okay, Philippians 4.19. What happens when we trust God? Here's what he says happens in Philippians. And my God will meet all your needs. And this word for needs here means God's going to cram it full. I love that. He'll meet all your needs. By the way, it doesn't say want. I heard somewhere you can't always get what you want. I'm just saying. And my God will meet all your needs according, listen to this, not your riches, according to The riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Basically, God has all you'll ever need. When's the last time you said, God, right now I need, I just need you. God, I need to know your love. I need to know your presence. I need to know your care. God, right now that person needs that. When I look at my family member who's struggling right now, Lord, they need to know your love. God, as I look at this situation where the doctor told me something, God, I know you know that. So God, you provide strength for me to walk through whatever you have for me. I would love to tell you, as soon as you become a Christian, all your health problems go away. And if that was true, Ralph wouldn't have shared three times this year for me when I was in the hospital. Right? But God gives you strength to walk through those things. So if you're struggling physically right now, he gives you strength. If you're struggling mentally right now, emotionally right now, he gives you what you need. God, I need your strength. When's the last time you took time to count, to remember God's benefits? I want to encourage you this week, when you get discouraged, when you get overwhelmed, to stop. Stop staring at the small things. Back away and recognize how good God is and recognize his love for you in the middle of that. God absolutely loves you. He loves you too much to leave you where you are, 
but he absolutely loves you. When the Bible says God so loved the world, that means before you got your act together, God doesn't stand there going, I'm not giving you a hug till you straighten up. He runs at you first, hugs you, and then helps you to straighten up. Don't get it out of order. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's the first step. Jesus, I need you. I know you died. I've heard about the story over and over, and I believe that you died and rose again for my sins. I believe that you did that because you love me. And if you're here today and you want to surrender your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, take my sin, I surrender my life to you. If you want to do that today, I'll be here after the service. I'd love to pray with you just to confirm that decision that you've made, to give you some material to go forward. Maybe you're here today and the truth is you're worried about a lot of things. You're having a hard time having joy. Hey, present it to him today. Lay it at his feet. He's going to take it. And when you pick it back up, give it back to him. Let's close in prayer today and then we're going to have our time of offering. You can give what God put on your heart today. Thanks for being here. Lord, thank you for today. I thank you for your love for us. It's beyond anything we can imagine. Lord, the deepest love we've never ever had is way beyond any any touch of how much you love us. Help us just to get a, a glimpse of how much you care for us today. Lord, for that one today that's discouraged, Lord, that needs to be renewed, I want to pray that even today you'd begin to renew their hearts and minds. That one today who's full of worry and frustration, Lord, that right now, even now, they first would know that you are going to provide for them, that you're going to take care of them. Lord, I pray also you'd provide people to surround them to show them that you are still there, that you love them. Lord, we love you. We thank you for these moments together. In Jesus' name, amen.